I dreamt last night The moon was so bright It melted the walls away And it wasn't alarming When I saw Prince Charming Come into my bedroom and say Let me persuade you to come to the place Where tomorrow meets today Ooh! If you were a scientist, you were it. Your excellent science, I'm your faithful servant. Building a new world. Thomas Midgley was born in 1889. He became a chemist and an inventor. In 1921, he solved the problem of knocking in car engines. He put lead in petrol. In 1930, he discovered a new coolant for fridges. It was called by its initials, CFC. Midgley became part of a golden age of chemistry in America in the 30s. Chemistry, alchemy, magic. The modern laboratory of today's chemist, fantastic in appearance as it is, is far out in the very vanguard of progress. The holy of holies, wherein science moves in mysterious ways her wonders to perform. In 1935, Midgley predicted that in the future, chemistry would solve many of the world's great problems. The ozone layer, he said, could be altered to control the sun's rays and allow scientists to govern the world's agriculture. In 1940, Midgley contracted polio. He built a pulley system to lift himself in and out of bed. But in 1944, he became trapped in it and strangled himself. That same year, the American army began mass producing CFC to help spray a new, some said miracle chemical over the Pacific battlefields. It killed insects. It was called DDT. Project officer on the first aerial application of DDT that was ever made in the world, I guess. And we flew it over several square miles of jungle, and I was walking around some trails we'd cut in the jungle floor, and there was an incredible, describable rain of insects of all kinds coming down out of the tops of these huge jungle trees, 100 to 130, 40, 50 feet. We got the cerambicid beetles, uh, beetles of all descriptions that probably many people had never seen, or if anybody had ever seen, because they're in the tops of the trees. I remember particularly some uh, big of these longhorn beetles that were coming down. There were uh, wasps and bees of all descriptions and so forth, and it was an incredible experience. And uh, I guess what occurred to me then is that maybe this was one of the best ways to collect insects and find out what kind of insects there truly were in a representative area of the jungle. And that's just one of the more innocent things I guess one could read into it. The low-flying planes cover every section of the city, from the coast of Manila Bay to the outlying environs, in an effort to destroy the large numbers of flies and mosquitoes plaguing the area. Prior to the spraying, the populace was informed that the insecticide would not injure vegetation or clothes. In American bars, there was a drink which was called Mickey Slim, and it was a good gin with a spot of DDT in it. And this was supposed to give you a feeling of happiness and merriment. Then in Naples, uh, in 1943 and 1944, there was an enormous epidemic of uh, typhus. 
transmitted by the human body louse in this. About 10 million applications of DDT dusting powder were made to people and they wiped that out. And those things got enormous publicity in uh, household magazines like the Reader's Digest. Everybody wanted to try DDT and the civilian population could hardly wait to get their hands on it when it was released uh, in 1945 for civilian use. Well, it was sort of a miracle that happened, and uh, by word of mouth, it spread rapidly, and I think uh, everyone tried it. I remember uh, one time in 1952, it was summertime, and we were going to have a birthday party right here on the lawn, right here where we're sitting. And the day before, I sprayed all the grass with uh, water and DDT, and this got rid of the flies, and it also killed mosquitoes. And you know, flies in the afternoon while the sun's shining, and mosquitoes after dark, those are two things. If you could get away from them, you could have a wonderful party out here, and we did. We had a pest-free party out here on this farm. Chemical people would show us test plots, and the quality of the corn would have little small ears where the weeds and the insects had taken over, and where they'd used the chemicals, the ears were bigger, and with the yield was two to three times as much. Science appeared uh, harmless, very helpful. We had uh, used the atomic bomb, which was probably the result of science, you know, and uh, we thought we had won the war with it. And now the uh, insecticides and pesticides were coming along, and they seemed to be working very well. So. Uh, it was an era of optimism, and people look forward to what's going to come along next. Whatever it is, it will be good, because the last was better than we had before that. The United States was a continent plagued with insects. Farmers lived in perpetual fear of finding a new infestation. Whole crops were regularly destroyed by pests. DDT and the other insecticides invented in its wake promised victory in this war. This man is a farmer, yes, but he is also a detective, a plant pest detective. giant spider. What next? You don't in England. Anything like the insect life that we have. You don't have to have screens on the windows in many places. You can't survive here that way. Come on, just a little bit. We are edgier about them. Anything with six legs is an enemy. Yes, this is our enemy. Insects not only eat up our agriculture, they threaten the very health of our land. I've seen the time uh, full fields of crops would be ruined from the insects before the chemicals come into effect. I, I can remember the cutworms and the wireworms would absolutely clean the fields of corn and wheat. And there would be nothing left to harvest. And then when your chemicals come along, you had this to uh, eliminate the insects and uh, you had your crop then. <laughs> Grasshopper control leader, Wyoming, be on guard for possible outbreak. Warning, state grasshopper control leader, Nevada, tremendous egg population, your state. Montana, be on guard, possible grasshopper outbreak. Texas, Arizona, Utah. Airplanes chartered by ranchers, states, and the federal government baited millions of acres of rangeland in the most heavily infested areas. Spraying insecticides that spell death to the invaders killing off millions and billions of hoppers.
it was a miracle chemical to us because we thought it would control practically every insect. Well, I guess it was just a, a time in the period that God had decided that he would let us discover these chemicals and use them wisely, and uh, I, I suppose everything, uh, the whole system is directed by God. So I guess this was the time that uh, we would uh, find our knowledge given by God would lead us to find these uh, natural resources to use, to control, do away with some of the slave labor. Uh. It just seemed like we were on another era. We were going forward, we thought. Life was so much easier than it was, and we hoped that we would progress like that. And, and that's when we called it the Roaring Fifties. We were making the progress that we wanted. We made more money and to have some recreation where sometimes farmers really had to work from daylight till dark. As times were better, we felt just as important as the people in the cities. And we wanted to live and have conveniences like they had. In that way, we thought we were building the American dream. Maybe we looked at it wrong, but that's the way we felt. And that's what we tried. <laughs> The incredible success of insecticides led to a wave of invention. Chemists vied with each other to design new, more powerful products. This in turn transformed other sciences, in particular the study of insects, entomology. Entomologists had traditionally been figures of fun, eccentric scientists who spent their time classifying insects. But this was now important information for the chemical companies. They began to employ large numbers of entomologists. In the process, the focus of their science began to shift. We were fed these new chemicals uh, so rapidly, many of us didn't have time to do anything else but test the new chemicals. There seemed to be uh, the chemicals being introduced into the pipeline and inexhaustible pressure to put something out the other end. And uh, literally, uh, we forgot about good basic entomology and became, uh, in a sense, I think, handmaidens of the world chemical industry. The reason entomologists to exist was the fact that they could kill insects and control the ones that were damaging man and his aspirations. But the entomologists began to discover what appeared to be serious side effects. As they investigated the effectiveness of large-scale spraying programs, they found that many other species of wildlife were being harmed. We found out soon that there were some side effects even as early as 1946 and 47. But the benefits were so great, uh, we eradicated malaria from the United States, let alone many other places in the world. And so there wasn't the public pressure on. We were killing off birds in some cases. It was quite obvious that these species were disappearing starting in 47 or 48. And by 53, even the birds that lived quite a few years were beginning to disappear and they weren't replacing themselves because the eggs weren't hatching. And we're worried, but we're trying to assess what was really going on. You see, you can't just say, I'm going to stop this because I think that it's bad. You have to say, well, now how bad is it? And evaluate the degrees of badness. If you are making good money from a product like they did with DDT, we don't stop it unless somebody says, this is very bad, and some companies did not even stop at them. These side effects led to serious disagreements among the entomologists. At their annual conference in 1953, their president made an impassioned defense of the chemicals. His speech was entitled, The Greater Hazard, Insects or Insecticides. The choice, he said, was a simple one. Either continue spraying or return to the bad old days of starvation and disease. Everything should be done to minimize the side effects, but ultimately it was a war of survival. Insecticides had already saved 100 million human lives throughout the world. At our scientific congresses and meetings, we were completely uh, immersed in uh, 
haze of uh, propaganda about chemicals. Uh, there were lavish hospitality suites, uh, banquets sponsored by the chemical companies, and uh, a great many entomologists were employed by these companies, and I'm sure they were absolutely convinced that what they were doing was of fundamental and a very valuable importance to the world. The chemical companies also portrayed the battle against the insects as a necessary war. Promotional films of the 1950s invoked Charles Darwin. They depicted it as part of the inevitable struggle for existence. Wherever man is, there the ant is also. They seem to come from nowhere and suddenly are everywhere at once, crawling over the food. As the hordes invade, man often gives up his pleasures in utter despair. It is the law of nature. The strong survive. Now, in evolution, all living species are essentially in competition with each other, and the ones that are most successful survive. And insects, as has been said, will inherit the earth because they're so successful. And insects carry diseases to, to human beings, such as malaria, and when we spray to kill the insects, we're interfering with evolution. If evolution were to proceed, then we would be overwhelmed by the factors that are against us. Do you realize how easy it would be for them to overcome us humans? Then instead of being the hunters, we'd become the hunted. They'd be our masters, they'd live on us. When people in the post-war period spoke of a struggle in nature, they were selecting one aspect of Darwin's theories that suited their time. Now for Darwin, nature was a bloody battlefield. There were winners and losers, victors and the vanquished. But this imagery took on special significance in the Cold War years. In the American Midwest, when I was growing up, the household aerosols were called insect bombs. The point is that in these life and death struggles, scientists believed that they were seizing power from evolution and redirecting it by controlling the environment. They took it on faith from the biologists that this is how the world works. And then they chose to emphasize those aspects of Darwin's theory which fitted in best with the industrial programs they were embarked upon. This was not a neutral reading of Darwin at all. This was an interested reading. Our relationship to nature is that we are a competing species with all other organisms. And we have to be ingenious, otherwise nature will overcome us with starvation, with famine, with disease. The balance of nature is mosquitoes carrying malaria to cut down the human population. That's the balance of nature. Anything left behind? Nothing but a dead spider. Well, this time he's going to stay dead. Dead and buried. Well, let's say at least until some egghead comes along and digs it up again. Yeah. The first serious public attack on the widespread use of pesticides came from Rachel Carson. She was a biologist who had worked for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. In the late 50s, she began collecting evidence of the side effects. In particular, studies which showed that DDT was becoming more concentrated as it worked its way into the bodies of larger animals. In 1962, she wrote a book called Silent Spring. It was an attack on the chemical companies. It started coming out in the New Yorker. She kept it rather quiet. She knew that the chemical industry, or the uh, part of which she was worrying about, would react. And sure enough, the, uh, the official of the Velsicol Chemical Company wrote a very threatening letter to Houghton Mifflin. You must not print this book. And came out with the standard uh, line that they still use. You see, if we stop using all these pesticides, it would simply ruin the whole economy of the country. And this is a sinister plot by the uh, far left subversive forces, as they called them, uh, to destroy the United States. Silent Spring painted a dramatic picture of a poisoned America. It caused an immediate sensation. It coincided with revelations about thalidomide and the fallout of strontium-90 from nuclear testing. Congress held hearings on the regulation of pesticides. Even the president was dragged in. There appears to be growing concern among scientists as to the possibility of dangerous long-range side effects from the widespread use of DDT and other pesticides. 
Have you considered asking the Department of Agriculture or the Public Health Service to take a closer look at this? Yes, I, 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 and I know that they uh, already are. I think particularly, of course, uh, since Ms. Carson's book, but uh, they are examining the matter. She was very euphoric about the attention it was getting, and I went with her to New York to give speeches, and, uh, you know, she was in great demand. And uh, she loved every minute of it. She bought a new mink coat, had a, got a lot of new clothes, and it was fun for her. Well, our birds didn't die, and we still had blossoms in the spring, and it, it was so extreme. Now, that's the way I remember it. Maybe that's been a while back. <laughs> he didn't read it. I never it. did read it, <laughs> but, but I I'd listen to it, but <laughs> I thought it was far-fetched, you know, that it wouldn't, that's one thing that you just didn't think would happen. It was a catch-22. We would like to stop, but we didn't think that we could. If we would stop, we would not have the crops that we were used to, and our income would suffer, and we all had families to feed and to educate. So uh, it was a hard decision, but we kept on using it. Rachel and I went to a big party in New York that the president of the Book of the Month Club gave at a very posh hotel, and, uh, you know, we felt like, uh, you know, we were in the, the swim of New York intellectual literati society. When I got the book, when I got home, I read that, and I got, I got about two-thirds of the way through the book, and I saw so many things I knew were not true that it, that it bothered me. When I set out to make a lot of speeches to try to, uh, to let people know what she had said and what was really the truth, many other people were doing the same thing uh, across the nation. So usually, at some time during the talk, somebody would be interested in, what about the effect on people? And it was handy at that time to have a box of DT like this one, and so I could just dump some out in my hand and take some of it to show that it's not harmful to people. Never has been. Nobody's ever been killed by DDT. I've not even heard of anybody being made ill by it, even when they attempt suicide. In 1963, the book was made the subject of an hour-long TV special. Three of the program's sponsors, food and chemical manufacturers, withdrew in protest. Carson used the program to widen her attack on the chemical companies. Now, uh, to these people, apparently, the, the balance of nature was something that was um, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Well, you might just as well assume that you could repeal the, the law of gravity. Man's attitude toward nature is today critically important, simply because we have now acquired a fateful power to alter and to destroy nature. But unless we do bring these chemicals under better control, we are certainly headed for disaster. Ms. Carson maintains that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature. If man were to faithfully follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the Dark Ages, and the insects and diseases and vermin would once again inherit the Earth. The uh, ironic thing was how Robert White Stevens died. He died as a result of the sting of a wasp. In 1963, Rachel Carson died. Although her book had caused an outcry, it had no immediate effect on the use of pesticides. But another attack on the chemical industry was about to be launched, this time from the suburbs. Although the faces of America's major cities seem relatively unchanged, a quiet revolution has been taking place there for nearly a decade. More than a million persons each year have pulled up stakes in the cities and turned commuter. America's suburbs had grown enormously during the 50s, often on land made habitable for the first time with the use of insecticides. But continued spraying to treat diseases such as Dutch elm now brought the side effects of the chemicals into the gardens of the wealthy and articulate middle classes. 
We live in what's called the Gold Coast area, the wealthier people. And so we had money right away to buy this stuff and the machinery and the men. And so they went around and squirted, first of all, from the ground. But that didn't last very long. Soon, it, well, there was a, a, a whole page in the Sunday Milwaukee Journal on how now Shorewood and Fox Point and Bayside, where I live, were really going to take care of their elm trees. And they had a photograph of a helicopter spraying with DDT. And not too long after that, the robins started going to the vultures. It would start out, you'd see the robin, you'd think it would be all right, and then all of a sudden the squibbling would come out. Those robins got in the way of the spray and they got drenched with DDT and they fell to the ground and they were twitching and paralyzed. And that seemed like a terrible thing. And it was for those robins. But there were millions of other robins that weren't being hurt at all. You'd be awakened by this of, of, of them coming over the house. And one day I was so angry that I raced up into the attic and opened the dormer windows in my little pink nighty and I climbed up on top of the roof and I just stood there and shook my fists at them. They are quite typically well-to-do middle-class people and they are interested in protecting their homes and their summer homes. What happened next was that there was a spraying of DDT in Long Island and um, Mrs. Yanacone didn't like it. The first time I noticed it, I drove past here on my way home from work, and there were dead fish for about 10 feet out from the side. This is noticeable as you drive by. The massive fish kill in this lake, and as we later found out, other lakes were all ignored, largely because the suburban population that was seeing this had nothing to compare it against having come from the concrete canyons of Manhattan and Brooklyn and Queens where I came from and not knowing what the natural state was supposed to be. The scientific community, which should have been observing all of this, was too busy making new products or living in their ivory towers. Let us take charge. We will bring you better things for better living through chemistry. Victor Yanacone was a lawyer. Together with two local biologists, he founded the Environmental Defense Fund. Its aim was to legally challenge the use of DDT and other pesticides. Their argument was that the chemicals were spreading in uncontrollable ways, becoming more poisonous as they did so. One of the strongest pieces of evidence was the disappearance of the peregrine falcon. DDT was being found in their bodies, and their eggs were failing to hatch. Two ornithologists set out to count the falcon population. We were simply going to follow uh, a route from uh, northern Alabama all the way up to the state of Maine. And we started in, uh, I believe it was early April. And birds should be on location uh, at that time. And we simply worked our way northward and we followed a very torturous uh, route. And we checked something like 130 sites or something like that in the course of the next three months, driving uh, a little over 14,000 miles. We found uh, zero, not one peregrine falcon. In 1968, the Environmental Defense Fund discovered an obscure law in the Midwestern state of Wisconsin. It allowed anyone a legal hearing if they believed they could prove water pollution in the state. Go Northwestern, go Northwestern, it's the very best way to go. Using this as a pretext, the fund engineered a hearing and in November 1968, a small group of them traveled to Madison, the capital of Wisconsin, in the heartland of America's agriculture. The hearing was held in the vast state legislature. It quickly became a trial of DDT. The star was Victor Yanacone. His main aim was to get the public's attention, to explain why tiny amounts of a chemical could have such large effects. We had to explain that a part per million was significant. We did this by calling a very prominent scientist from the pro-DDT camp. And we asked him a very simple series of questions. Doctor, uh, do you have uh, any idea what the uh, purpose of uh, the hormones that uh, flow in your blood is? 
Yeah. And they're responsible for your secondary sex characteristics, the hair on your head, the hair on your chest, the tone of your voice, right? Do you have any idea what the uh, level of testosterone in your bloodstream is necessary to give you that lovely shock of white hair, all that hair on the chest and the uh, uh, grandchildren that you're so proud of? And he finally admitted that it was five parts per million. I said, well, do you have any idea what would happen if the level of testosterone in your blood should drop to as low as three and a half parts per million? He averred he didn't know, and I said, well, you know that that hair of yours would change, the hair on your chest would disappear, the hair on the rest of your body would change, your voice would go up to a little squeak, and you sure as hell wouldn't have any grandchildren. The public got the point. One part per million could be very significant. Victor Yannacone was a genius in the courtroom, and once he arrived in Madison, he was the man who controlled everything. He made us all snap into line. He would time the, the proceedings so that the, uh, the courtroom was shut down, the hearing room was shut down just before 4 o'clock, and he'd have a story for the, for the reporters. The next day's headline, as this poor scientist got off the plane to go back to his laboratory, was, noted scientist says DDT destroys sex. There was not enough room in the paper for the hormone, and they left it at that. The Madison hearing soon became headline news, with both sides claiming that everything America stood for was at stake. At the height of the battle over DDT, I wrote a poem and sent it in the Time magazine. It was a parody on America the Beautiful, and I'll sing it for you. Oh, beautiful, for bog-filled skies, for weevils in the grain, for apple scab and stable flies, please bring these back again. Malaria, malaria, red blood cells harbor thee, where Rocky Mountain fever thrives, where babies have TB, where parasites take human lives, why, that's the land for me. Malaria, malaria, my spleen will welcome thee. Restore the sickness, Grandpa, you by banning DDT. I walked in, Yannacon looked at me long and hard and says, I think he'll do. And then he looked at me and says, can you between now and tomorrow put together a lecture of about 40 slides of all the different pictures of the Wisconsin ecosystem so it'll be not only beautiful but emotionally rich and will affect the people who listen to it. So I said, I'll try. Next day I came here and gave this talk with beautiful slides of the prairies and the woods of Wisconsin. It was, I'm sure, the first time anybody has ever shown uh, wildflowers in the chambers of the Wisconsin legislature. In the late 60s, ecology was a modest scientific backwater. Ecologists spent their time studying the mutual dependence and balance of all the inhabitants of a particular area. But for Yanacone, ecology was a powerful weapon with which to attack the defenders of DDT especially the entomologists. It gave him a scientific basis to challenge the idea of evolution they used to justify the large spraying programs. The entomologists, who should have known better and now, 30 years later, admit they should have known better, simply saw the death and the extinction of what we now know to be beneficial insects as the operation of the fundamental law of survival and evolution. What they didn't realize is the kind of evolution they were looking toward was the evolution of monsters arising from garbage dumps, of chemically deformed animals and plants. What they thought would come out of this was a, a simplified world ecosystem with good plants, bad plants, weeds, good insects, bad insects, good animals, the ones we eat, bad animals, the ones that take up space. There was a problem, though. If human beings were inextricably interwoven with other parts of nature, as ecology said, 
where were the effects of DDT on humans? In 30 years, no worker in the DDT factories had been poisoned. The defenders made great play of this at the hearing. But then in early 1969, the Environmental Defence Fund received some unexpected news. A Swedish chemist by the name of Göran Löfroth wrote a letter saying that they have found in almost all women in Sweden DDT in the mother's milk. Well, we went to my house, we finally said, hey, let's call up Sweden. And we did. We got him out of bed. He must have been four o'clock in the morning then. He spoke pretty good English. What do you want? He says, we want you in medicine. He said he would come. Thursday came and went. Friday at 10 o'clock, people went out to the airport. It was all hush hush because we, the, the testimony was droning on and on and on, the pesticide this and the chickens that and the eggs this and so forth and so on. My God, when just hours, I mean, we have, after all, we have 14 of these volumes, 2,800 pages of testimony. The stenographers went bananas. Anyway, at 11.30, somebody high hold me, little sign, and we went outside the hall, and sure enough, there was Gerwin Lerfroth with his little suitcase. In the meanwhile, of course, we had called the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post. All these reporters were waiting in the wings. It's happening! Hiya, happening! Oh, oh, hello, everybody! And then for the next three hours, Göran Lerfroth laid it on the line that if babies eat, drink milk, of cows that grazed on land that were sprayed with DDT, their fat is going to contain DDT. And not only this, but its fat, of course, is in the brain. Most brain is fat. It will be loaded with DDT by Sunday, front page of the Sunday New York Times. And the opposition was just livid with rage, but we won that one. I'll tell you, from then on in, it went all our way. They were just furious, and one man got up and he shook his fist and he said, how do you dare not do this? Why are you paying attention to that lunatic fringe over there, those pseudo-scientists? He said, I've got a family to raise. He said, I need DDT to take care of my nursery and these trees. So it was, a, it was a furious explosion at the end of the day. And another time, very, very early... Did you one have any sympathy with that? Heavens no. 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 Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! We got fun, we got freedom, we got joy. We got fun, we got freedom, we got joy. Boy! When I heard it was banned, I, I really felt bad about it because I felt it was a, a victory against science. And uh, I felt that uh, scientists and, uh, and industry had a place in this country and uh, certainly being uh, undermined by the statements about pesticides in general. It's gotten worse since then, of course. After banning DDT, the others were easy. Uh, somebody said maybe because DDT was so easy to spell that people immediately thought about it. What an elegant party. Who cares if there are a few uninvited guests? The nation's farmers do by using pesticides to maximize agricultural... It felt like they were wanting to take something away from us as farmers. Take the chemicals away from us. People in the cities that was not familiar with farming were not aware of the actual facts, is the way we felt about it. We felt that it was going to set us back years of progress. Where once chemicals were seen as good, now they were bad. In the early 1970s, press and television became fascinated by any reports of the side effects of pesticides and herbicides. What happened? That leg's just malformed, but he's when he, he was crippled, he was born after the spring this year. That's the only evidence in And above all, by the effects on human beings. The first analysis was phoned to me yesterday to say they have found the residues of 2,4-D. So I guess I'm the first documented case to say it is residual in the human body after you've been exposed to it. I will do everything I can to see to it this never happens to anyone else. Because 
This is still our country. Number one, I'm an American, and I love my land, and I love my country, and no one has the right to deprive me of my health. The battle against DDT had been won ultimately by evidence of its presence in humans. Now the Environmental Defence Fund placed advertisements in the national papers implying that DDT caused cancer. Donations flooded in, but the decision split the leadership. The Environmental Defence Fund and Carol and I parted company over the issue of whether the shift should be from the questions that we were sure of, that DDT was bad for the environment, to the speculation that DDT might cause cancer. I don't believe in going to court on speculation. I go to court on relatively solid evidence. DDT is not good for mammalian systems. It damages the nervous system, it damages the liver enzyme systems, it causes some problems. It is not a strong carcinogen. It is not, except in very large doses, associated with serious human health hazard. Its real problem is that it had the capacity, had it continued to be used at the rate it was being used, to literally destroy almost the entire world natural ecological system on which we really depend and would have meant the ultimate collapse of the human species as an animal species. The DDT hearing was a watershed, not just for the battle against chemical pollution, but for the science of ecology. Ecologists became influential figures, giving scientific advice in the battles against other pesticides. But in the process, their science was transformed. It became the guiding force of the environmental movement. Beginning with the unintended consequences of DDT, the science of ecology had emerged as a useful tool in science. And many people began to see it as something that could be drawn upon for moral enlightenment as well. The notion of everything being connected to everything else. The notion of a kind of ecological harmony and balance. And eventually this came to be seen as a philosophy that could guide uh, human societies, guide individual behavior and so forth. Well, ecology is a balance of nature. What do you mean by ecology? Well, uh, to clean it up, not to pollute the atmosphere, the land, the water, mm -hmm. everything to do with nature. And then we had an awful lot of just self-appointed environmentalists. People were just coming out of the woodwork, they're environmentalists. And many of us, uh, including those people that uh, were environmentalists, uh, didn't even know what the word meant. It's the relationship between me and uh, plants and animals and the world in general. I remember the first time I ever heard the word environmentalist uh, on the air was on an Oscar Godfrey show. And, and he was uh, trying to explain what it was, and it was hard for him to explain what, it, what the drive, what the era was. So it was really a new era. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. Hopefully, we'll, by the end of our lifetimes, have collected enough knowledge so that we could, if we had to, go out just to some place that's not imminently threatened by some kind of military installation or something like that and just you know build our dwellings and start farming organically and have enough technology that's that's adapted to pure energy sources so that we can live in an environment without polluting it without upsetting the natural balances that are already there ecology yes that's what i'm talking about two days ago a man whose controversial predictions of a forthcoming global catastrophe have made him an international figure arrived at london's heathrow airport he is Paul Ehrlich, professor of biology at Stanford University, California, and the chief spokesman for the so-called ecological movement. Dr. Ehrlich, just how realistic is your projected theory of the eco-catastrophe? Well, I, I think that uh, it's getting more realistic all the time. The signs are getting worse, but I still have considerable hope because although governments are very slow, uh, people all over the world are uh, awakening very rapidly to what the real danger is. 
In much the same way as the science of entomology had been changed in the 1950s, now ecology was transformed by the social and political pressures of the early 70s. Ecologists became the moral and spiritual guardians of a new view of the human relationship to nature. And they too cited Darwin's laws to prove that their view was correct. Nature has a set of laws that all organisms have to obey by necessity because that's the way they evolve. And this applies to human beings very much so. If we need to introduce into our lives nature, it is a need that is enormously deep. Look around you wherever you go into homes. They are not only living flowers, they're not only aquaria and pets. Look at the wall, what do we see? Sunflowers by Van Gogh or irises by Van Gogh or, or pictures, photographs of landscapes. You don't see framed in a house a picture of a crankshaft from a, from a Ford or, or a, 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 a tin can squashed. Now in, in modern art, which is a sick art, because it reflects the confusion in the human minds. Yes, indeed. You make it sound like they're a set of laws that we have to obey. Well, the laws are, is very simple. They are the laws of evolution. They are the laws that were uh, voiced by Charles Darwin, that we can be happy. What happiness is, is to be allowed to act or to be free to act the way evolution meant us to act. Darwin's so big that he can support any number of generalizations about the world. I mean, given Darwin's image as a scientific saint, people inevitably try to get him on the side of their view of nature. Now, Darwin was complex. In The Origin of Species, for example, the metaphors tumble over one another in the most unscientific way. Sure, nature's seen as being at war, but nature's also likened to a web of complex relations. Here then was another aspect of Darwin for people to seize on for their own purposes. Darwin gave them a basis for urging us not to take control of nature, but to cooperate with it, to stay within its balance. Again, Darwin serves up slogans. In the popular imagination, scientific theories are something fixed, and if they're good theories and accepted by creditable people, well, then they're absolute, and that's that. What people don't understand is that scientific theories never have a single meaning. They, always, they become a cultural property. They are usable, serviceable for different interested parties. Gracious, what a scandal every other girl would cry. She can't hold a candle to somebody such as I, but who got the banker's boy and 50,000 quid? Today, the story of DDT continues. The head of a large property company has called a press conference to announce that he has stopped construction in one of his skyscrapers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let me move over this, this side to have a more light. What's happening here this morning? Well, uh, the peregrine falcons have been nesting in this building for five years. Mm -hmm. And every year the peregrine society comes and retrieves the eggs. The eggs uh, will not hatch here because uh, the, due to DDT contamination, they're too weak for the bird to sit on. Somebody's pushing it. Each year they bring back a, a small baby for the bird so that they feel that uh, they've completed the cycle. Okay. You all, did you want to come in closer? Basically, the, the people are here because it's not just a story about the. the eggs being laid and gathered. It's a story about how this particular developer, the J.H. Snyder Company, has literally suspended construction in this area during the mating season of these particular birds. And how it's a, an excellent idea of how developers and business people can participate in environmental concerns. Come on. We've got plenty of time he's going to stay. Right here behind him. Does everybody have everything they need in the way of shots? You saw the number of TV cameras and the media people that were up here today watching the manipulation going on. This, in effect, is really a, a, a myth 
being born or being fostered at any rate. Looking out from the ledge 26 floors above Wilshire Boulevard, it's hard to believe that the Falcons would pick an urban area like this to nest. The myth the in this case is that the uh, peregrine falcon is sacred. Granted, it's a, it's a precious species. We were about to lose it perhaps a number of years ago. Now we have peregrines back in good numbers. There have been dramatic uh, recoveries. I think it's just an unrealistic attitude about how, how sensitive parts of nature are. Why are these birds important? Well, like all extinct or nearly extinct species, they represent, I think, parts of, of our uh, environment, our wildlife, that are necessary for the ongoing um, preservation of just the world as we know it. Uh, basically, the falcon is necessary because it does help with the, the chain of, of food, maintain its balance. Uh, there are probably a lot of other reasons that, that I actually am not schooled to talk about, uh, not knowing a whole lot about the falcons, but I know that we can get those answers for you if you really need them. Okay. At the start of the DDT litigation in 1966, science had become the way that the human beings could avoid responsibility. Science would take care of us. After the DDT wars, we knew that science was not necessarily going to be the answer. But mankind in the 20th century still wanted to avoid responsibility for their own individual actions. Now it's nature that's going to permit us to shift the responsibility from human beings to some force that we don't have to take responsibility for. What we're talking about is a very profound internal shift of attitude and of values. This is the gift of ecology to human beings and really to all species today. And that gift uh, can give rise to not utopia, but ecotopia, which is this profound sense of place, the sense of coming home at last. The kinds of ideas about ecology and environment that we see today, I don't believe, are any more scientific or rational than previous notions of nature. In both cases, uh, people that talk about them are saying, look, this is scientific. I'm not making this up. These are not my hopes and dreams. This is what science tells us. But in both cases, I think what you can see happening is there are particular kinds of social ideals being read back to us as if they were lessons derived from science itself. In the case of contemporary ecology, it seems to me what we're actually getting is a kind of utopia of a perfectly constructed complex universe of natural things and from that universe one tries to, to derive various kinds of laws that can help us live better as human beings. I think it is a moral lesson. There is a possibility for a kind of utopia. We've dreamed about it and that possibility exists in our future. The wounded winds of north, south, east and west can be purified and cleansed and the integrity of nature can be made whole again. Sure, it's possible to seek moral guidance from nature. It's done all the time, but it's illicit. The reason why people want to seek moral guidance from nature is because they want the universe on their side. They want something fixed, something absolute, usually something with the name of science behind it to support their particular policies. The scientific and technological notions of the 1950s, the ideas of endless possibilities for exploitation of nature, are now seen as ill-conceived and ill-guided. I'm haunted by the possibility that the ideas of ecology that we now embrace today may in 30 or 40 years seem similarly ill-conceived. And they're no more scientific than, let's say, other notions of nature that we have looked to in the past. <laughs> At least when science was our god, we felt that we were actively doing something. We were in control. Now there are too many people that say, there's nothing I can do. Nature will take care of it. I just will continue fat, dumb, and happy the way I am. We must go back to the simple lesson of history. Every human being concerned enough dedicated enough and willing to make the sacrifice can change the world around them.
1860, Charles Darwin wrote to a friend in America about whether it is possible to seek divine providence in nature. I feel most deeply, he said, that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. A dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton. Let each man hope and believe what he can. just got to get to the top. Top? Top of what? Why, the top of the... Oh. Oh, gosh. Gosh, I just can't believe it. I was sure it would be here. Oh, sure. Keep going. Stick together. Everything's going to be just lovely when we get to the top. Well, we're at the top, and where's this paradise we heard so much about? Do you think we'll ever know what's best? We will uh, one day, but it won't be here on Earth in our lifetime. Uh, We'll know when we get to heaven, we'll know what's best. Oh, look! Over look, everybody, look! Starlight Square. Where the Hoppity! Oh, Hoppity! In the castle, on the corner, there's a cloud bed. And we bank our millions there. Look at the human ones down there. They look just like a lot of little bugs. Wash it down, it's very dry. <laughs> 